welcome to another milling training video from DAPRA, your provider of high performance, 100% American made milling tools. Now, in our last two videos, we discussed choosing carbide grades and cutting geometries for your milling tool. So today, we'll wrap up this three part series and take a look at how to use your catalog recommendations to come up with good speeds and feeds based on the application type. Recall from video number five on choosing your cutting edge geometry that when you refer to your cutting tool catalog for help in setting up your milling application, you're generally going to be given these pieces of information. Your grade descriptions, geometry descriptions, cutting speeds in surface feet per minute, and cutting feed rates in feed per tooth. And we talked about how important each of these is for a successful milling program. For this session, we're going to take a look at choosing a speed and feed for your milling application. You'll note that there are typically ranges provided by your cutting tool catalog for the various material group types, but these ranges are generally either too wide to be easily applied or too narrow to cover all possible scenarios. Our discussion will offer suggestions on translating those ranges into useful numbers depending on the type of application being run. We offered this initial advice in video number five, and it does bear repeating here. When starting a new application, if you're not sure of your choices, follow these basic guidelines for the safest start to your milling setup. You can always optimize after you've seen some initial results. First, start tough with your carbide to reduce chances of tool breakage. Start in about the middle or lower half of the recommended speed range to avoid rapid overheating of the cutting edge. Start in the lower end of the recommended feed range to avoid chipping or tool breakage and start with less depth of cut than you're ideally hoping for in order to gauge how the cutting tool, machine tool, and fixturing are handling the cutting forces. Finally, start with the recommended cutting edge geometry or edge prep that your supplier's catalog recommends for the material being machined. Taking another look at our recommended speeds and feeds chart, we recall that once we've found our material group being machined and we've chosen a carbide grade and picked a cutting geometry for that material, we then look for the speed and feed ranges. Now notice in our example that the speed ranges for tool steels varies by about 4 to 500 SFM and the feed range varies by 6 thousandths. Well, how do we know where in these ranges to start our machining parameters? Let's look at some general concepts about speed, cutting forces, and heat to see if we can't shed some light on these questions. We'll start with a pretty basic piece of physics that the amount of work being done is equal to the force used times the distance moved. Now don't worry, we're not about to teach a physics lesson. We just touch on this so that we can follow up with some good common sense conclusions that we can draw from this. When machining, the more force created, the more work is done, and the more heat or energy that is present, because whenever work is done, energy is transferred from one place to another. The more distance involved in the process, the more work is done, and the more energy and heat transferred. The more work that is done, the more heat and force that is present. Now you can forget all that and just pay attention to the bottom line for us as machinists which is that the more work that's being done, the higher the spindle loads will be, the higher the temperatures present, and the more tool pressure will be involved. We can use these facts to make some good predictions about our milling program and where in the speed and feed ranges we might want to operate. We will do more work and create more heat with our cutting parameters if we program for a heavier depth of cut or width of cut, program a heavier chip load or feed per tooth, program to a higher speed, or if we are cutting a harder material. Any of these can shorten tool life due to heat or pressure if we choose the higher end of our speed or feed ranges. On the flip side, we will do less work or will tend to create less heat when we program for a lighter depth of cut or width of cut, program using a lighter chip load or feed per tooth, program at a lower RPM or speed range, 
and when we are cutting a softer material. These are all factors that create less heat and pressure, potentially allowing us to operate in the higher end of the speed and feed ranges. Let's break that down a bit better, looking at it this way. You may be able to run on the faster end of the speed ranges if you're cutting softer material, taking lighter cuts, either width of cut or depth of cut, or when using a smaller diameter tool because all of these things create less heat. On the flip side, you may need to run in the lower end of the speed range if you're cutting a harder material in your ISO material group, programming with heavier depth of cut or width of cut, or when you're using a larger diameter tool because all of these create more heat and can negatively affect tool life if adjustments downward with the speed aren't made. Taking the same approach regarding feed, you may be able to choose the higher end of the recommended feed range if you're cutting softer material, taking a lighter depth of cut or width of cut, or if using a stronger, larger diameter cutting tool. In any of these cases, there is less stress on the cutting tool itself, so you may be able to feed more aggressively. On the other hand, you may need to choose the lighter end of the feed range when cutting a harder material in your ISO group, or when taking heavier depths of cut or width of cut, or when using a smaller diameter tool, which is of course weaker. In any of these cases, the pressure on the cutting tool is increased, so the lower end of the recommended feed ranges is likely your best choice. So to summarize briefly, if your application will involve performing heavier cuts or the machining of harder materials within a material type, you can expect that both higher heat and higher tool pressure will result. To protect against this, select a lower speed in SFM and a lower feed in feed per tooth for your program, at least in the beginning. If you expect your program to involve a lighter cut, as is the case for finishing cuts, or is in a softer material within the ISO group, you should be able to expect less heat and less tool pressure as a result. As such, you should be able to feel more comfortable programming your tool to a higher speed and a higher feed within the recommended ranges. Notice how careful we are when making these suggestions to specify within the recommended ranges. We do that because running your cutting tool outside of the recommended range can have undesirable consequences. In the case of feed, running a chip load or feed per tooth that is less than the lowest end of the recommended range could cause the cutting edge to rub significantly during the machining process. This rubbing action creates additional friction which will generally create premature wear in your cutting tool, creating more frequent indexing with an indexable tool or tool replacement in the case of solid tools. On the other end of the spectrum, running your cutting tool over the high end of the recommended feed range can overload the cutting edge design or the carbide strength, creating the potential for tool breakage, which at the very least jeopardizes your cutting tool but could scrap the part being machined or even damage the machine tool spindle. In video number five, choosing the correct cutting edge geometry, we introduced the four most common cutting edge types. Here are what would typically be the feed ranges for each of these cutting edge types. Now keep in mind that these are basic recommendations without taking into consideration any special design or lead angles which we'll discuss in a later video. The T-Land Edge, which is the strongest, will generally recommend a feed range between four and 12 thousandths per tooth. The Neutral Land Cutting Edge is a bit more positive or freer cutting, so a typical range here might be between four and 10 thousandths per tooth. The Honed Edge is the sharpest design that is still suitable for ferrous materials and can be run somewhere between two and seven thousandths feet per tooth. An upsharp edge is most commonly used for very soft, non-ferrous materials, and as such can sometimes be run at feeds far exceeding any of the others. For the most part, speed is not quite as volatile as feed. By starting in the middle of a recommended speed range, you may be a bit too fast or a bit too slow, but your error will usually be shown in tool life variation. Depending on your shop's philosophy regarding tool life versus output, 
this number will vary up or down to favor that philosophy. If you run in the faster speed ranges, you will achieve better output, but will have to change your cutting edge more frequently. Conversely, running too slow will reduce output, but may allow long run times before tool indexing or replacement is required. This can be helpful in shops where unattended operations are taking place or where single operators keep multiple machines running. Bottom line, find your sweet spot that fits your philosophy for either prioritizing output or prioritizing tool life. In a future video, we'll discuss the value of each of those, but here's a hint, output is generally much more valuable than improving tool life in terms of job profitability. Keep these concepts in mind related to our previous video on choosing your carbide grade. If you choose a tougher carbide grade, which can take shock better than it can take heat, you'll need to choose the lower end of the speed range, but you may be able to choose the higher end of the feed range. On the other hand, if you choose a harder grade of carbide to use, which can take heat better than it can take shock, you should see better results by running the higher end of the speed range and the lower end of the feed range. One special case that defies the norms is finishing. When looking at feed ranges in your cutting tool catalog, keep in mind that for the most part, your ranges are with general or rough cutting in mind. When finishing, it is sometimes more critical to achieve a certain defined appearance or finish than it is to achieve a level of productivity. As such, you'll often want to run at the bottom of the feed range or even a bit below if this is necessary to achieve the desired surface finish. Working at a lower feed per tooth than the recommended range can cause the rubbing that we mentioned previously, but in this case it creates a burnishing effect that can smooth the surface of your part. Adding coolant to the equation often increases this burnishing effect, further enhancing the surface finish. Again, this is a special case scenario and not otherwise recommended. Okay, now that we've addressed many of the factors involved in selecting your speed and feed range, let's look at a few example applications and see how we might use the speed and feed chart to help us get each job programmed. Taking what we've just learned and applying it to our speed and feed chart, we should be able to see that when working in a tougher 316 stainless steel, programming a speed of about 400 SFM with grade DMP35 GLH will be more appropriate when roughing, which creates more heat. But if our cut is a lighter one, or we're finishing the material after roughing, then we should be able to creep up more towards the 700 SFM mark or even higher, depending on the material, depth of cut, and width of cut. For our feed rate, when roughing, we might start around 6 thousandths feet per tooth within the range of 4 to 10. When taking a lighter cut, we should be able to run more towards the 8 to 10 thousandths feet per tooth range. If we want a nice surface finish for face milling, we may run on the lower end of the range to close up the milling lines. What if we're running some 1018 steel and need to execute a 2D profiling cut around the part. Let's say there's only about a quarter inch stock per side and we're using an inch and a quarter diameter end mill. That means our width of cut is going to be a pretty small percentage of our tool diameter, so the width of cut is lighter, relatively speaking. Given that this is a softer material to machine and that our cut isn't especially heavy, we should be able to program a speed in the upper end of the range, perhaps around 12 or 1300 SFM. This may go up or down slightly depending on depth of cut, but not by much. Our feed range is shown as 6 to 15 per tooth. Again, we have a decent size end mill, a softer material, and a lighter width of cut. So a starting feed per tooth of maybe 10 to 12 should be doable, assuming tool holding and fixturing are reasonably solid. Let's look at just one more example to take a special case into consideration. Let's say we want to get a nice finish while face milling a hardened piece of H13 tool steel. The recommended grade for this material is DMK25 GLH and the speed range shown is 300 to 800. Since the cut is a finishing style cut, 
we should be able to run a higher SFM or speed. But be careful, as a larger width of cut in this case of face milling will generate significant heat at the cutting edge due to the hardness of the material. If a 50% or greater width of cut is to be taken to maximize cutter coverage over a larger area, then keep the SFM perhaps in mid-range to avoid rapid wear. If the situation were different and we were instead performing a finishing cut on a hardened mold insert with a ball nose style tool instead of a face milling tool, the width of cut would be much lighter, so we could certainly run higher ends of the speed range. Now for feed. On this face milling cut, we're both hard milling and looking for a good finish. So we would generally recommend the lowest end of the feed range or even a bit below if necessary. We want to use a T-land insert and keep our feed per tooth less than the width of our T-land to take advantage of the strength of the cutting edge. Remember the T-land is usually four to six thousandths wide, so you'd want to stay below that. Run air blast in this hard milling application, no coolant. A note about speed. Keep in mind that we said work equals force times distance. When using a larger diameter cutting tool, you will be creating more heat than when using a smaller diameter cutter due to a longer TIC or time in cut. Because of this, an adjustment may need to be made to the SFM or speed that is chosen for the application. If the SFM that works well for a one inch cutter is also used for a two inch or three inch cutter, you should expect shorter tool life with the larger cutters. If this is acceptable, then no problem. Otherwise, adjust the SFM downward by perhaps 20-25% to compensate for the increase in heat with the larger tools. Here's a quick illustration of that, and we see that the distance in the cut for the one inch cutter on the right, operating at 50% width of cut, is about three quarters of an inch per revolution, whereas the distance in the cut for a two inch cutter shown on the left taking the same 50% width of cut is twice as long. This extra time in the cut will affect tool life, so either be prepared to accept that change or make slight adjustments downward in speed for the larger tool. If you need more convincing, see what happens to tool life when slotting, where 100% of the tool diameter is engaged in the cut. Many cutting tool manufacturers recommend slowing the speed as much as 50% when slotting due to this same increase in heat because of time in the cut. I'll leave you with a reminder of these general rules of thumb. Keep in mind, no set formula works for every application. Certain material types, application types, fixturing issues, cutting tool types, and other variables can make you adjust on the fly. This is just part of the acquired skill of machining, recognizing challenges and dealing with them effectively if you utilize the knowledge and experience of your cutting tool provider's application specialist to get a solution more quickly, it could make the difference between profit and loss on the job. In our last three videos, we've covered choosing the correct carbide grade, geometry, and speeds and feeds for your milling application. Now hopefully the information presented has taken some of the guesswork out of your milling setup. Please contact APRA for further information on any of these subjects or for more information on our American-made milling tools. Check back with us soon for another milling training video from DAPRA.